Okay, I'm too soon. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you to everyone for coming today. So we are <coughs> delighted to have Professor Lisa Chasson Tabor, who's here in the Department of Epidemiology and Public Health for her sabbatical until the start of June. So she's uh, going to talk to us today about writing research grants. So you'll have seen from the email sent around that Lisa has actually published a text called Writing Dissertation and Grant Proposals, Epidemiology Preventative Medicine and Biostatistics. So she, today she's going to talk us through effective grant proposal writing geared particularly towards early stage investigators. And she's going to talk us through the 10 top tips, everything basically that we all want to know about research uh, proposal writing. So hopefully we'll have time for questions and comments at the end and there'll be some handouts as well during this, the talk. So 45 minutes? Basically. Yeah, we have it for 45 minutes. It might go a little bit over, but we have the room for longer. So if people do have questions, feel free to jump in at the end. It's great. And Brenda, is there a clock just so I can see how it's doing? Um, You'll I'll give me a warning? Know. Okay, good. All right, well, thank you so much for having me here today. Uh, let me make sure I can do this. So here's our, our lovely university, the University of Massachusetts in the States. Um, and of course, the photo is during the prime foliage season, just to kind of show off where, where I'm from. But that's, uh, that's my home university there. And um, today, what I'm hoping to do is to go over 10 top tips for successful grantsmanship. And what this really comes from is through my work serving as a reviewer on NIH, National Institutes of Health Review Panels. But I've also served um, as a reviewer on a number of international uh, review boards as well, including the Irish Health, I think, Research Board, it's called. And I found that these themes are really consistent across all those agencies. That's why I think it's relevant to talk to you about these tips today, because they they really are uh, patterns that I've seen across all agencies. And then if we have time, um, I'll go over some additional tips uh, for just how to, how to couch, how to present your study limitations. But if we don't have time to get to that, um, at least you know it's, it's in the book, so you can always look at that there. Um, all right, so tip number one, start small but have a big vision. Uh, so early on in the process, when you're just starting out, what I've always found is that it's really critical to be able to have a vision of your ultimate large project. And then to back off from that and to think about each small grant that you start writing as an early career faculty or even as a postdoc, to provide preliminary data for one to two specific aims of that ultimate larger grant. What we always find at our university is new faculty will come in and they want to make a big splash right away. So they come in and they say, oh, I want to apply for an R01. And an R01 is NIH's biggest grant proposal. Almost impossible to get straight out the bat like that. NIH likes to see, and most granting agencies like to see, a nice track record of small, smaller projects, but they want to make a big splash. So it's very tempting almost never goes well. Um, so this idea of peeling, thinking about that larger project, but peeling off a bit, um, shows that you've got a real goal, you've got a clarity of purpose, but you're on a stepping stone. So this is sort of an image of what I've been, what I've been talking about. You sit down maybe with your mentor and think, okay, where do I want to be in five years? What is the large grant that I want to do? And typically a large grant will have, let's say, five specific aims. I just put three here for simplicity. You want to think first about little pilot grants that you can conduct that will support each of these ultimate aims. So that when you actually get to the point where you're sitting down to write that large grant, you can say, hey, here's our aim one and here's our feasibility data for aim one. Here's our aim two and this is the data we have to support the viability of that aim, etc. So that's kind of the thinking that we try to get our, our new faculty to do. Now, of course, all these small grants are going to have limitations, and that's great, because if they answered your questions, there'd be no need for the larger grant, right? So they'll all have smaller sample sizes, they'll all have smaller budgets, that's okay. Um, they're not designed to provide the definitive answer to your ultimate large project. So instead, they can do wonderful things in and of themselves. They can give you some feasibility data. They can show just that you have experience as a PI managing your own grant, dealing with personnel and budgets and progress reports and you know publishing based on the findings of that small grant. They can show proof of principle that you can pull off a project. Um, and you know this is a great quote when you're applying for those small grants to say you know findings from this pilot study will yield critical evidence to support the subsequent submission of what we would call an R01 or a larger grant. It shows that you have a vision of what you're going to do with that data and reviewers always like to see a, a sort of story. 
Um, and great projects for the, these type of smaller grants are reproducibility and validity studies of the measures you're going to be using, uh, or pilot studies of actually recruiting people into your studies. So let me give you an example of all of this, just sort of all together. So let's say I'm, I'm a new faculty member, just arrived, and I, my real goal, I sit down with my mentor and I say, my real goal in five years or four years is to conduct a large prospective cohort study of vitamin D intake and risk of depression. That's where I want to be, and I want to do this large cohort study, follow people over time. So I sketch out, actually, right then, right when I've arrived at the university, my aims of that large grant. My first aim, let's say, and I'm only going to put three here. Typically, it would be five, let's say. Uh, to evaluate the association between self-reported vitamin D intake and risk of depression. My aim, two is to look at a biomarker of vitamin D and the same outcome. And my aim three is to look at sort of a genetic interaction to see if vitamin D impacts uh, depression risk differently among people with, let's say, a certain genetic uh, factor. So this is just a, an image of that. Um, grants, grant reviewers love to see figures and diagrams, so great to sketch this out anyways because you'll have it when you ultimately apply for that grant. So these were my two exposures I was interested in. This was my outcome. This is the little genetic interaction I'm looking at. And then you actually write your aim numbers next to these arrows. Reviewers just love this stuff. So it makes them so happy. You look so organized. And you know they're looking through a whole stack of grants. And they're happy. And everyone's happy. And you want a happy reviewer. Trust me, that's, that's the best kind of reviewer to have. So if now I step back and I think about what I want to do to support each of those aims. The, this, this plan here has all kinds of pilot studies, all kinds of small grants you could do. So you could apply for a small grant to uh, pilot the validity of your questionnaire in your study population. You may see that it's already been validated, but it, maybe it hasn't been validated amongst your group of people. Uh, you could apply for a small grant just to see, can you follow people? Can you look at their vitamin D and follow them for risk of depression? Maybe I'll write a small grant to validate my depression measure. Maybe it's based on self-report. And then, you know, I'm not going to have the kind of big data I would need to look at a genetic interaction, but maybe there's some kind of publicly available data in a different population where I can run this data analysis just to see if maybe there is some kind of thought that there is a genetic uh, interaction going on. So I'm busy with all these small grants over those couple of years while I'm leading up to the big project. And this sort of just writes out what I said um, on the prior slide. You know, so each, each of these small projects supports an aim. When you go to write the big project, you have this preliminary uh, analysis section that, that really lays all this out for the reviewer, all the work you've done. OK, so the results of these pilot studies yield this wonderful data. We talked about this a little already. You know, your pilot feasibility study leads uh, to you to have eligibility um, rates, recruitment, retention rates. You can use that for your power calculations for your larger study. You can have administered satisfaction surveys and say that your participants were happy and satisfied. Uh, you'll have measurement error data. Uh, you can use that later on, and it's just going to show that you know how to, again, write a grant application, manage logistics, and translate that into publications. So when I was a, a grant reviewer at NIH, um, I started <coughs> back uh, probably 12 years ago, and at that time, things weren't as electronic as, in the old days, things weren't as electronic as they are today. So we would be sent ahead of time, literally, a paper stack of the grants we had to review. And those days, they were 25 pages long. So you would get this box in the mail, and you'd have to read your, let's say, eight assigned grants before the meeting. And you'd come to the meeting, and everyone would sit in a big circle. There'd be 25 reviewers. And in the middle of the circle were these recycling boxes. And when you'd be done reviewing a grant, people would you know, toss, because they're confidential, people would toss the grant into the recycling boxes. So my scariest day was my first day reviewing when we looked at someone's grant and everyone said, oh, these aims are overly ambitious. And everyone picked up that person's grant and tossed it like into the middle, into the recycling boxes. And there that went that grant. And you just thought, oh my god, that could have been you know, my grant. It was the scariest vision. Now that doesn't really, <laughs> people are not laughing. It's not a funny joke. <laughs> so, that, so that is what they would call a fatal flaw. Um, and again, it's the most common reason, we would call it triaging, but it was a reason not to be discussed at an NIH meeting, which means you'd just get your score, it probably wouldn't be funded, and time wasn't spent discussing it. 
so that's something to avoid. And these tip, the first tip that I gave you is really to avoid that classic pitfall, an overly ambitious specific aim, and skipping straight to a large funding mechanism. The other sort of classic pitfall was interdependent aims. So let me show you what I mean by that. Um, now, I'm not sure how, if, if this is an issue here in Ireland as well, but certainly for NIH these days and with economic times being tighter, it used to be considered okay to embed a pilot study within a larger grant, to say, you know, aim one, we're gonna pilot our, our study and see how feasible it is, and aim two, we'll actually do the study. Um, now that's considered a real no-no by NIH. They wanna see all that work before, and I think most granting agencies are similar, because the idea is if your aim one is found to be, you know, not feasible or your questionnaire is not valid, how could you go on then with the rest of the study without really slowing things down and starting over and that type of thing. So there's no longer this feeling that you can kind of sneak in your pilot studies into a larger grant. Then the other thing I tend to do, because the funding situation is so scary these days, is to encourage early career faculty to have a lot of pots bubbling on the stove at the same time. So let's say we listed like four pilot studies that would have supported that big grant. I have people, you know, write a couple of them early on and send them off, you know, don't do one at a time. So maybe we would send one off to an internal university seed grant for funding, and maybe we would send one off to NIH for one of their small grant um, funding mechanisms. And so we do a lot of that so that you always have hope, you know? <laughs> Once you get one rejection, you're like, well, I'm still waiting on this other grant. You're never just in a situation where you're just waiting for one thing at a time. The other sort of sneaky thing we do, and we've never gotten into trouble for this, is to take the same pilot proposal and submit it to two different potential funders. Now, let me, let me kind of tell you why this works out okay. Maybe we'll write a pilot for validating our questionnaire. We'll send it to a foundation, and maybe we'll send it to an internal university seed grant. And they may ask, you know, have you submitted this elsewhere? Often they don't. Often they end up looking slightly different because of the requirements of each one. One may be larger or longer or smaller. We've never had the situation where we've gotten both and had to sadly decline one. <laughs> you know? So in a way, it's a risk well worth taking in that um, I think you'll almost never find that you get both when you try and send out the same project to multiple. Um, it's not that they talk to each other. It's just that getting funding is so difficult. So we do some of that as well. Um, so that's sort of my, my tip number one for grant funding. Now we talked about small grants again. Um, NIH specifically and, and other funding agencies, I know March of Dimes has this too, and uh, American College of Sports Medicine, they have grants targeted to early career investigators. And it's so great to take advantage of those while you can, because later, um, you know, that time period will have expired. And you'll never be in that position again where you're only competing against early career faculty. So, and also the hit rates for those are much better. So I think that's a great opportunity to be sure to take advantage of. Typically, they kind of give you a wave on a lot of preliminary data. Um, and the funding decisions rely more on your potential, your mentors, um, and that your education and that type of thing. So that's nice to, uh, to take advantage of. And when I talked about uh, the funding decisions being based on your potential, usually it's on maybe prior publications that you got out while you were a doctoral student or postdoc. Working on someone else's project is great experience. Um, and of course, your mentors, the more accomplished they are, the better you look. And of course, the public health importance of your topic as well. So that kind of leads us into how to identify a mentor. Um, at UMass, usually, or often, early career faculty will have a whole little team of mentors. So they'll have a teaching mentor, a research mentor, and a work-life balance mentor because just balancing this whole thing and maybe having a family and children is very tricky. So we have a lot of support for faculty, um, at least at UMass. And even if your department doesn't offer this, I've had new faculty come and say, I just, you know, will you serve as my mentor? There's no established plan for this, but will you be my teaching mentor or something like that? So people are proactive and reach out on their own for mentors. And when I came to UMass, I was really interested in physical activity during pregnancy, and there was nobody there doing any of that work. So I identified an off-site mentor who was an expert in the area and was willing to serve as my mentor. And you know, I see her probably just as much as I see people down the hall at UMass, because everyone's emailing each other and just going into their offices. So you know, there was really no difference in her and having her be off-site. So that's something to consider too, is you don't have to just be restricted 
uh, to people in your department. And the other thing that we, we try to advise people to do is when, to be really careful in choosing a mentor. So you want to ideally choose someone who is at the place where you ideally would like to be. So sometimes people get excited about a mentor, but then when they go on the NIH uh, website, which shows that person's funding, and they see, oh, this person's never gotten NIH funding. And that's my goal is to get NIH funding. Well, maybe that mentor is not the best mentor for that goal. So it's good to kind of, I don't want to say stalk people or kind of check them out behind the scenes, but see if they have the kind of grant funding track record that you ideally would like to have. Um, there's another website um, that also is a good place to go to sort of, sort of check out people's accomplishments. Now, while you've got all this going on and you've got all these grants that are being reviewed and these pilot studies and your whole trajectory, um, and, and maybe this is more established here, but what we like to encourage people to do is join in with some existing teams as a co-investigator. Now, of course, that doesn't give you sort of a track record as a principal investigator, but it gives you some nice payoff in between while you're waiting for your own grants. Uh, it's less work often, um, but not always. Quicker translation of publications if you're joining in with a group that's already really moving along and has collected their data and cleaned it. Uh, there's this nice opportunity uh, to apply for research supplements, some, sometimes off of very large grants. People can have small spin-off grants that are easier to obtain. And it, all of the data that you get from that co-investigator work, some of it may serve as preliminary data for your own projects. So it's a nice, it's a nice thing to, to look for. Um, and the con, again, it may not exactly match where you, you, know, where you see yourself. So when we think about what funding agency to apply to, as epidemiologists, that's my particular background, some agencies don't really fund epidemiology. They fund more bench science and that type of work. So sometimes we get into trouble if we don't look ahead, at least on the funder's website um, or through our grants and contracts office to see who they've funded in the past. Uh, we had a new faculty member at UMass who really wanted um, was it the Gates Foundation, you know, Bill Gates was providing some funding. I don't know at the time, maybe he hadn't funded epidemiology or it was a crazy long shot. He spent a lot of time on this. It never really panned out. So it's good to look through the list of prior recipients, see if the topic looks similar, see if they're in the same field. Um, and you know, one thing that we do is we'll actually reach out. If we see uh, UMass will show us who else has gotten funding by that agency, we'll actually reach out to that faculty member and say, hey, you know, do you mind sharing a copy of your grant? It's not that I want to steal your topic or anything like that, but just to get a sense of how they pitched it and the depth and the scope. Um, and people are often very willing to share uh, their, their grant proposals, again, with just that idea of mentorship in mind. The other thing we look at is who has served as a reviewer. If all the reviewers are bench scientists and none of them are epidemiologists or statisticians, again, it's something we try to avoid with the worry that they kind of won't get, get our research, population-based research. So it's nice to kind of check things out ahead of time before you jump into the, the grant writing fray. Um, these are just some websites that we use back home to check you know, if I'm writing an NIH grant, I'll go on their website and I'll search the projects and see uh, what's been funded in the past. Now, when we go on these websites of funding agencies, the best ones will have a way for you to search through abstracts of what's been funded before. And I could spend days doing this. I love doing this because <laughs> looking at these abstracts, you'll see, oh, so do most of these small grants only include like one or two aims? What are their sample sizes? Or are they really big? And do they have lots of aims? And it really helps you to get a sense of what a successful abstract looks like, what's been funded. And it'll really help you frame your own and know that you're not wildly, you know, being too ambitious, that, that awful word. Um, and you can limit your search on a lot of these websites to keywords that match yours. Uh, so that's nice as well. Okay, so tip number four, let's say you've, um, you know, you've identified your ultimate project, you have your mentor, you know what funding agency you're going, now you're actually going to sit down and start writing. And the advice we always give to people is spend about half your time on your one specific AIMS page. And later in the talk, I'm going to hand out an example of a specific AIMS page that actually needs a lot of help. <laughs> so um, this page is so key because at least uh, for the 
grants that I've reviewed as a reviewer, the whole panel doesn't read everyone's grant. The whole panel, though, will read everyone's specific aims page. And that page has to come off. You have to get everything you want into that page. What's new, what's novel, how you're extending things, what's exciting. And if you really don't get it across there, people don't really read the rest of the grant very carefully. Again, reviewers have a big pile of grants. So what we do is we just draft our aims first, um, kind of and send it around to our co-investigative team to get everyone's kind of buy on with the project. So the steps that I like to do are to draft the aims, immediately do some power calculations and see if my aims are totally ridiculous. Look at my budget and see, oh, can I afford to have, you know, do assays on a thousand women? And then immediately, nope, I can't. Okay, I'm going back and I'm redrafting my aims. Maybe I'm looking at a more common outcome or I'm, I'm looking at things differently so I'll have greater power. So I'm sort of following an iterative cycle here until I get the aims the way I want them, get all my co-investigators on board, and then I sit down and start writing. Uh, I talked about this already. At least at NIH, only three to four reviewers read your entire application, although all 25 reviewers vote on it. So, and, it, and the typical minutes of review are only 10 to 20 minutes, so it's, it's really daunting. So that, whoops, sorry, <laughs> scared myself. So that AIMS page has to be really concise and persuasive. Um, you know, it's where you have your big bang for your buck. Okay, so I'm going to go over a couple tips for crafting that specific AIMS page, just because I think it's so important, and then I, I'll have a handout good. <laughs> um, so let's see. So the, this is a framework that I have found to be effective, so we'll see what you think of this. Um, it's limited to one page for most of the funding agencies that I've worked with. And your goals on that page are to provide an overview of the problem, typically for us it's a public health problem, what we know, and what is the remaining question, or at least the remaining question that you're going to be kind of answering. How are you going to answer this question? So a brief synopsis of your study design, your specific aims and hypotheses, and then this is key these days too, um, your study significance and innovation. So when I talk back here again about what is the remaining question and how you're going to answer it, we call this the research gap. And any, any you know, upstanding grant has to fill a research gap. If it doesn't, it's likely not going to be funded. And there are lots of research gaps that your study could fill. And you could kind of look through this and think of others and check off as many as apply. Maybe all the prior literature, at least for my studies, was done among non-Hispanic whites. All my research has been done in Hispanic women. So already we have a gap that we always highlight. Um, maybe the prior studies all used self-reported physical activity. And in our study, we're going to use an objective measure. And even if they all didn't do that, maybe a lot of them had that limitation. And so it's still pretty novel. Maybe the prior studies were fairly small, and ours is going to be bigger. Maybe the prior studies are just so conflicting that we need more studies, because the jury's still out. Maybe prior studies didn't control for confounders adequately. They were limited to certain geographic areas. Or maybe it's simply just a very sparsely researched area. As many of these problems as possible that you can list, the better, on your specific aims page to say, here's the research gap. We're going to help fill this gap. So this is kind of a very detailed outline of, again, that same outline I showed you before of this specific aims page. So usually it's divided, at least the successful ones I've seen, into about four paragraphs. The first one is the importance of the topic, kind of your background, and your research gap. And the trick is not to spend too much time on this. Um, it's good to just hammer this home really briefly, but then to really get into your study methods. Because the reviewers will often know, yes, breast cancer is an important problem. Yes, you know, findings are conflicting. Um, so you can get that across fairly quickly, focusing on the research gap. Then go over your study methods, your aims and hypotheses, and then a kind of final big bang of what is innovative and significant about your study. So keeping that in mind, I want to hand out a real example of a specific aims page that I've kind of, I've changed the topic, but it was real. Um, this poor person now. <laughs> uh, but you'll never be able to figure out who it was. <laughs> um, and this was a, a page that we looked at. And it's actually, it goes over a page. So that's already problem number one. Um, and I want to just give you a few minutes to read it. And actually, could I get one too? Okay, awesome. Oh, so we're almost done, right? Okay, so I'll finish after. Yes, yeah. Um, if anyone doesn't have a copy, can they just put up my hand and I'll, their hand and I'll go get uh, more? 
few more making the rounds. <coughs> And you folks can kind of skim it. You don't have to go into too much detail. <laughs> So how about just any thoughts off the bat? Anyone have any initial reactions? <coughs> Anyone have any thoughts? You guys are so well behaved back home. Everyone would be like, oh, this is horrible. <laughs> I can't believe them. How could they have done this? <laughs> so obviously way too much at the beginning, right? Um, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. when you had it so funny, your, the first half page or more is just background stuff. So some of it is actually just tan tangent. 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 Yeah. So they have, they have left themselves with, with less uh, space for the actual aims. Right. And, and they're left wondering, you have no sense of what they're actually going to Right, right. It's so true. And some of the things they're telling you at the beginning, you think, well, are they going to fix that? Or is it, how is it relevant? And what's, what's the gap that's going to be filled here? So, you know, I think we were talking earlier about how the length of that earlier section is inversely associated with your ability, to, with your funding probability, right? So it's just spending too much. Yes. A similar process unfolds, and, and um, you just look at the, 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 the abstracts, yeah. and the yeah. one where most of the abstract was background, you knew straight away it probably wasn't going wasn't going to get funded. Yeah, yeah. So really to streamline the background. In a way, I think that this writer was trying to show off that they knew the area, but it's even more impressive when you can concisely uh, go over the area and say what it's missing, and then what you're going to implicitly do to fill that. So it's to assimilate the whole background and say what the gaps are, and that's so helpful for the reviewer. Here the reviewer has so much work to do. Um, and just in terms of saving space too, like, you know, well, the references are a little all over the place. You know, there's lots of ways to, uh, to save some space. So I guess what we could do now is hand out the revised version. And I'll just have that come around while I'm talking. But you'll see it's, it's shorter in background. It goes more into study methods. Um, it has the aims, it has hypotheses, and then it has significance and innovation. Probably still squish the background even a little bit more. But it fits onto one page, so that's nice. All right, so I'll keep going here in the interest of time. Um, and this, these two slides here just sort of go over, we talked about that last point on that first page being the significance and innovation of the grant. 
Um, what we like to do is to really make sure that we use the words significance and innovation because our reviewers have to fill out a little section on their grant review forms saying what's significant and innovative. And if you haven't helped them through that, they're not going to want to do that work for you. So I know reviewers will often just do a control F, you know, they'll just search on the word significance in someone's grant. And if there are no hits, they're like, well, I'm not going to figure it out. And they'll just skip that section. Or they'll do a control F on the word innovation. And if they don't see that in there, you know, the, the work's all on them to kind of come up with it. Now in epidemiology, innovation doesn't have to be coming up with a new regression model or a new study design or something like that. It could simply be looking at a hypothesis in a new population or looking at a novel hypothesis or something like that. So innovation here could just be, you know, really focusing on what's novel here to the field or what's new. Uh, it doesn't have to be inventing a new, a new methodology. And then the other issue is just the need for hypotheses. You'll see on the improved example, and I think actually even maybe on the original one, there were hypotheses. And you'd be surprised how many times these are forgotten, even in really senior investigators' grants. Um, it's typically considered really not fundable without having a hypothesis. Um, and so that is something that we really emphasize. So usually we embed them underneath the relevant aim. So you'll have a specific aim, kind of what you're going to do, and then what you think you're going to see. And going through and thinking about what you think you're going to see shows that you've really assimilated and compiled the literature and you have a, a hunch about what kind of association you're going to observe. So it shows that you're further along in, in the field. So if I saw a grant that just had these two aims, I would just look at it as a, like a to-do list. And I wouldn't look at it as thoughtfully as, as this one, which has the hypotheses right under the aims and has the investigator's best educated opinion about what they think they're going to observe. Now, a lot of this, I'm sure you folks already know, but good research hypotheses, of course, should always name your independent and dependent variables, the direction of relationship between them, not just that they're going to be related, but positively or negatively. Uh, we find stating the exposure before the outcome is always helpful because reviewers will get confused. Like if you're looking at depression and diabetes, are you proposing that diabetes causes you to be depressed or that, um, or the reverse of that, which I can't do standing up here, but obviously it could be looked at both ways. And then, whoops, and then what your comparison group is. Usually we're comparing exposed people to unexposed. And then when you've got a number of related hypotheses, kind of listing them in a little list is a good way to, uh, to save space. And then, again, just being really kind to reviewers and not to use synonyms. You know, I think we're brought up in creative writing courses to use different words for things. Reviewers love when you're just consistently boring and always use the same term to uh, refer to something. So here, they talked about courses in stress reduction. Um, and then all of a sudden, you see the word new approach here. And then the reviewer has to look back and figure out what's going on here. As opposed to here, you see courses in stress reduction. Um, and then, the, you know, comparing again to courses in stress reduction. So no, you know, no reason to use synonyms and that type of thing. Um, now, what do you do if you're in an area where everything's been conflicting and then you're asked to write a hypothesis and you don't know what you're going to see? Because some people have seen a negative association, some have seen a positive. You still need to show the reviewers that you've thought this through. You're aware that there's a lot of controversy in the area and that you've made a decision based on maybe these reasons. Maybe the studies that saw a positive association had stronger measurement tools. Maybe they were more likely to be prospective. Maybe they had more power. Maybe a review article also agrees that that's a direction. And you say, you're very transparent. You say this is a conflicting area. Studies have been all over the place, but we propose that we're going to see something positive for these reasons. And you show the reviewers your thinking. And, and they like that. They like knowing that you've really thought through things. How do you write a hypothesis that the prior studies are all null? Um, you know, we often go back to the physiology and use that uh, as something to bolster our proposed association. Or say maybe that the prior studies were null because they were too small. Or they use measurement tools that had a lot of misclassification, uh, et cetera. So there are reasons why you can um, argue that you're more likely to see something in a particular direction. And then if you can't um, identify a hypothesis, or a public health or clinical significance of your findings, it is time to go back and maybe think about a different topic. So it's a good exercise to go through. Um, if you're unable to kind of follow through, coming up with what's significant, what's innovative, what your hypotheses are, it may be a good time to go back and, and rethink your aims. And that's fine too. 
Uh, tip five, show that you can, I'm just going to go a little faster because of time. Uh, we talked about, you know, showing that you can pull it off. So you'll want to really build up who your mentorship team is, who your co-investigators are, and that you've all worked together. We find that's really important in a grant to show that you have been together working on uh, grants or presentations or publications. And you can show that off in your preliminary study section where you always name your co-investigators and that you've been a team in your personal statement on your CV. Uh, you can have them all write letters of support. And we even stick it in in the budget justification section where we talk about each of the co-investigators and their salaries. We talk about our longstanding uh, relationships to show that you're a real team. So this is a place where sometimes grants fall apart a little bit, is that they'll have extra methods that don't match any specific aims, or they'll have some specific, yeah, specific aims with no methods. So we try to keep ourselves really honest by repeating our specific aims in our data analysis section of the grant. You know, by that time, when the reviewer gets to your data analysis section, they're so tired and they've read so many grants, they've forgotten what you said you're going to do on page one anyway. So it's really kind to them to repeat your aims again. Make sure they match the aims on your first page, because I've seen sometimes people have changed their aims in between. And make sure for each one that you have a corresponding plan. And you know, these plans could simply be, oh, we're going to use the same plan as this plan. But you know, this way you keep yourself honest. Tip number seven I talked about before, I've never met a grant that had too many figures or tables. They're, they take time to do and they're so much kinder to the reader. And it, just even the process of making them helps you understand what you're proposing to do. So we very often have a specific aims figure like I showed you before. We, uh, if we have a theoretical model we're basing our intervention study on, sometimes we'll have a figure of that. We'll, we'll almost always have a study design picture because it's so much easier to look at this in image form and it saves you on some text space. Uh, for We had a nested case control study we were doing. It's a little hard to talk about that in words, so this was so much more clearer for the reviewers. Uh, again, very similar. And then we do a variable table. So not only does this help us really think about what data we're collecting, it shows that we're not wildly collecting too much or too little. It shows the time points. So just the act of thinking this through and why everything is not at every time point was you know, really helpful in writing a grant and helpful for the reviewers. And you see here you have the aims repeated so they can see why you know, you're collecting things for everything's targeted. And then some grants will put in a figure of their anticipated results with the idea that the reviewer is going to say, oh, wow, you know, if this grant goes the way it's planned, it would be pretty exciting to see. So you could have a figure like this and use these data in your power calculations, et cetera. So this is just a really quick example of taking data from a preliminary study, say this is data from your pilot study, and trying to write it all out in text. And imagine being a reviewer looking at this. this you'd be tired, you'd get cranky, and you'd be trying to figure out what kind of shape, what's going on here. So instead, this is the exact same data, but it's in a table. So, you know, the reviewer can look across these relative risks and see if there's a trend. But even kinder is to have a figure of this data. You know, right away, the reviewer can see what's going on here, can look at the width of the confidence intervals. So we spend a lot of time trying to package our data in really reviewer-friendly ways that save space as well. So tip number eight is to seek review prior to submission. The more comments you get from people, even from your grandmother, I find the better. Because anyone who's just you know, a general reader can see if you've clearly stated your goals, even if they're not in your area. You know, that you wrote down what's new and how your grant extends prior work in the field, what's innovative, and what the impact of your findings will be. So even if someone's not in your area, they're going to be able to see that you've gotten those points across. So we do a lot of internal review at UMass. We have mock study sections that simulate our NIH study sections. We'll uh, give new faculty money to send their proposal out to an external reviewer to get you know, feedback before they submit the grant. Because you want all the comments then and not after it's been submitted. And then just other little kindnesses. Again, happy reviewers are good. So we use a lot of subheadings. We'll bold key sentences in the background section. And the great thing about that is if you can't find a sentence to bold in your paragraph, then there's something wrong with your paragraph. So it helps you be honest as well. In the preliminary study section, we make sure each preliminary study says what aim it's supporting. And then we often have a little like sound bite of our study in the methods section that the reviewer could use when they're pitching the study to the other reviewers during that review panel. 
just to make it easier for them. This little kind of method section summary paragraph, if you have that in one place, when the reviewer is, is you know, explaining your study to the rest of the review panel, they can just look at that and go over all the key features of your study. And then last tip, tip number 10, if at all possible, choose a topic that you're really excited about because you're going to spend so much time on this that it, you know, it's much more, uh, leads to a happier life if it's a topic that you're interested in. And, and that's it really for today, so thanks. <laughs>